The sixth meeting of House Elections Constitutional Amendments Meeting uh, Committee will come to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Representative Blanton. Present in the room. Representative Cantrell. Here. Representative Fisher. Representative Gooch. Present in my annex office. Thank you. Representative Heverin. Present in the room. Representative Heron. Here. Representative Imes. Present. Representative Cook. Here in the room. Representative Derek Lewis. Present in the room. Representative Miller. Representative Moser. Representative Nemes. Representative Scott. Present. Representative Weber. Present in the room. Representative Wheatley. Here. Representative Scott Lewis. Present in the room. Representative Bratcher. Here. Thank you. Everyone, please turn your phones either off or on mute or whatever. Uh, we'll, we'll recognize guests right now, and I want to say we have some of the brightest young ladies in Kentucky here today. They're all on the back row, and if they'd please stand, Mercy Academy, and everyone give them a round of applause. Such a great school. Thank you guys for being here today. We have a new member, Representative Heron. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. Would you like to say a few words on your first uh, day in House elections? Yes, I am actually super excited to be um, on this committee. Uh, the last time I was at this committee was in 2020 um, as a lobbyist working on restoration of voting rights. And so I look forward to continuing on that work and uh, working with you all. Thank you. And I remember that well, and you turned a few uh, opinions that night. I was, did, and let's, hopefully we can keep it going. Yeah. <laughs> Would anybody else like to recognize a guest? Chairman. Uh, Representative Scott. Thank you so much, Chairman. I want to recognize that we have with us today Missy Spears from Covington and Angela Roll from Moorhead. They are both shadowing me, shadowing me today, and they're with Emerge Kentucky, which trains Democratic women to run for office. Please make them feel welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Representative Cantrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have with me Nisi Hillis from Hopkinsville today. Please make her feel welcome. Thank you. Okay, first on the um, agenda, excuse, excuse me, who said something? Somebody say something? <laughs> first on the agenda is House Bill 330, sponsored by Representative Massey. He is at the table. Please identify yourself, and you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair, and members of this committee for allowing me to present this bill here today. Um, 330 is what we call as the vote hauling bill. Uh, this bill actually in 2020 passed out of committee and passed, I believe, on the House floor. And then we simply ran out of time uh, due to the COVID pandemic for it to go any further. So this is just a exact reproduction of that bill that was here before. Specifically, it's just a two-page bill. And more specifically, on page two, paragraph six is really the important part of the bill that basically says no candidate or a candidate's campaign committee shall pay for any person, including campaign workers, for the purpose of transporting voters to the polls on the day of any primary, regular election, or special election. It then goes on to define pay. It doesn't mean that transport cannot happen. It just means that the money from the campaign account won't be used to pay people to do that, which gives an unfair advantage potentially to some. So with that regards, that is the gist of the entire bill. Um, it's not a problem in all communities. It is a problem in some communities. And in fact, uh, some of my, my colleagues have had asked me to bring this bill with regards to that. So that is the nature of the bill. I'll certainly answer any questions. Representative Nemes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman Massey, straight ahead. There we go. Uh, I have a comment. I want to make sure that my comment is accurate, and then I've got a question. So the comment is, the reason this is necessary is because in some areas, there is a tradition of a campaign or a candidate paying people to quote unquote, wink, wink, nod, nod, drive people to the polls that's when correct. actually it's a way to pay for votes. Uh, that's my comment, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and I wanted to make sure that we are not talking in any way, especially in a time when we are having fewer polling locations. We're not talking about organizations, nonprofits um, that are trying to just get people to the polls. Those people are not covered by this bill. 
This is candidates and their campaign um, apparatus. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Wheatley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for bringing this bill. Uh, I do remember, I do recall voting on it uh, a couple years ago, but I, I wasn't on the House Committee at the time, so I, I have a couple questions. And, and uh, I always appreciate uh, one of my seatmates or nearby seatmates because I, I frequently turn to him on the floor and say, what's this? What? And, Ed, and uh, Representative Massey, you always do well in explaining. So basically here we are, we currently permit campaigns and campaign committees to pay the expenses of getting people to the polls and we allow campaigns and campaign committees to actually pay for the actual work of getting people to the polls currently that's, and that's correct that's correct right. and, 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 and this would no longer permit the pay and for the work of actually doing bringing people to the polls for instance if somebody has an expense they have gas expenses their car expenses that's fine but you can't pay somebody fifty dollars to bring a group of people to the polls including your own campaign staff and a campaign committee is that let, correct? Let me, I didn't read the entire provision. The second part of the provision says pay as used in this subsection shall not include reimbursement of expenses actually incurred. Any person who knowingly violates it goes on to say it's a class B misdemeanor. So you're paying the campaign or the candidate would be paying an individual to get as many people to the polls as they could. It's not talking about expenses or reimbursement of expenses. It's talking about, as Representative Nemus said, basically the wink wink nod nod to get as many people there to give you an unfair advantage thank you just one follow-up sure. real quick it, and just to i don't mean to be naive with this question but just to give us an example of of how this wink wink nod nod works and why would that have been illegal previously or yes previously and and, and illegal at this time but how was it not caught in the past with the existing law well, the best example, I can give you a couple of examples, actually. You know, vote buying has been going on for a long time. Um, you know, there was a, a big dust up, I think, in Clay County a few years back where um, actually a local a circuit judge and a board superintendent were indicted on basically paying for votes because they control the largest employer in the county. Now, that wasn't transporting, but it goes in the same vein of things. So if you have somebody that's there and um, you say to a guy, hey, you know, I'll pay you $500 if you can get pick up 20 registered voters and take them to the polls to vote for me. Then that's what vote hauling really is indicative of. It's not talking about declining people that are actual voters from voting. We want them to go to the polls and cast their vote for their desired candidate. We're talking about people manipulating the system to try to get an unfair advantage using money to do so. Thank you. Representative Cantrell. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to be super clear about this. You know, like Uber and Lyft have the sort of deals where they uh, give their drivers kind of like a voucher to take people to the polls on Election Day. That's not intended to be covered in any of that, this. That would not be, be paying out of the campaign fund or right. a candidate directly paying somebody to transport Correct. people. Correct. And then I've got one other clarification. So if I personally am out during the four days that we now have uh, to, to vote, and I go to somebody's door and I say, hey, have you voted yet? And they say, no, I can't say, do you want to go? I, can't, I cannot personally take them. You can't pay, you can't be paid to take them. Okay. That's the difference. So what this is, is using campaign financing, using campaign funds, or a candidate paying to make sure that somebody that otherwise may not have voted would get to the poll to vote. It doesn't mean that you couldn't drive somebody to the poll to vote. Okay. And then if I want, if, if some, someone wanted to provide like gas cards, for example, that would be proof that they only paid for the expenses. And That's not expenses, the... not compensating somebody to take. So them. that'd be a good way to do that. That's correct. Okay. Thank and you. there's, there's also, if you go through the entire bill, it talks about the processes in place to make sure there's adequate documentation. That's what make... I'm probably most concerned about. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I was getting at. Anybody else? Clerk, call the roll. Oh, we got it. We got to have a motion. Motion on the bill. Got a motion from uh, Representative Cook and 
second from Representative Moser. Please call the roll, ma'am. Okay. Representative Blanton? Aye. Representative Kentrell? Aye. Representative Fisher? Representative Gooch? Yes. Representative Heverin? Yes. Representative Heron? Pass. Representative Imes? Yes. Representative Hook? Yes. Representative Derek Lewis? Yes. Representative Scott Lewis? Yes. Representative Miller? Representative Moser? Yes. Representative Nemes? Yes. Representative Scott? Yes. Representative Weber? Yes. Representative Wheatley? Pass. Representative Bratcher? Yes. House Bill 330 passes with favorable expression. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, committee members, for allowing me to present. Now we will have House Bill 564, Josh Branscombe and his troops. <clears throat> we do have a committee sub. Does anybody want to move that sub? Move on the sub. Motion to accept sub. Representative Nemus moves it and seconded by uh, Derek Lewis. The committee sub for House Bill 564 is before us. And now the floor goes to Representative Branscombe. And you control your uh, folks down there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> might be hard to do. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. Josh Branscombe, State Representative, 83rd District. I'll let my guests uh, introduce themselves. I'm State Representative Jennifer Decker, District 58. State Representative Rachel Roberts, District 67. Jason Denny, Anderson County Clerk and President of Kentucky County Clerks Association. Thank you all once again uh, for the opportunity to be here to speak with you on House Bill 564. Last session, this General Assembly passed one of the largest election reform bills in nearly 100 years with House Bill 574. This is a bipartisan bill uh, that made it easier to vote while adding increased security to our elections. Like many bills, oftentimes we have to follow up to do some cleanup or some housekeeping. And I appreciate the opportunity to once again uh, work with Representative Decker, Representative Tipton, and this year uh, as well with Representative Tate, Representative Roberts, uh, Representative Wheatley. I always appreciate your feedback as well. Like House Bill 574, we worked closely and sought the input of our county clerks, the State Board of Elections, Secretary of State, many of whom are here today to support the bill. House Bill 564, it's not an election reform bill like what we've seen last year. As mentioned, this is primarily some cleanup language. However, there are some areas in which we've included technical changes uh, to help increase the efficiency and security of our elections. It's a pretty large bill. I'm going to give you just a brief overview of what the bill does. The bill creates a new section of KRS 117 that separates in-person absentee voting for mail-in absentee voting. This will provide clarity for reference and you'll see that there's many sections where it looks like we're adding new language and there's sections where we're striking uh, existing language. In, in a lot of those situations, the language that has been struck has actually been moved over to the new section. There's been a few changes, but for the most part, that's what it is. We've established the time for the in-person absentee voting or what we call early voting. That's the Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Those times had not been set, so we wanted to make sure there was uniformity while still allowing our clerks some flexibility. The bill fixes what we call the gap period, and we spoke about this um, at the uh, Kentucky State Fair that this was an item that we were going to be working on. What we call the gap period for allowing absentee voting. This is probably one of the major cleanups of the bill and is the primary re reason why we've declared an emergency. So the last day to request an absentee ballot through the portal is 14 days from election day. After that, uh, there was no mechanism in place to request a ballot uh, or vote excused absentee until the Thursday of in-person voting. So we've got a gap there. So if, if on day 13, you find out, the portal closes day 13, you find out that you're not gonna be able to vote uh, in person, uh, whether that's um, on election day or the Thursday, Friday, Saturday of early voting, 
there was no way that you would be able to vote or get a ballot. So this bill lays out the criteria one would have to meet in order to vote excused absentee. We've taken the previous statute of when we used to be able to vote absentee prior to COVID and apply that to this period between the 13 days out from election until the Thursday of in-person voting. We have to make sure that we're not punishing our hardworking Kentuckians who you know, may find out on day 13 that they're not gonna be able to vote. The bill also prohibits the transmittal of absentee ballots until six, six o'clock prevailing time on election day. We've also set up security protocol to where two election officials must check the record and sign off on the numbers on the public counter of each voting machine at the end of each night of voting. And the following morning, they check it again to make sure those two numbers match. Additionally, the tamper resistant seals are to be checked at the end of each day and the following morning to ensure that no voting equipment has been tampered with. Prohibit voting equipment that tabulates or aggregates votes used in official election results from connecting to any network, internet, or any device external to the voting system. And we've added that any attempt to do so is a Class D felony. Can you say that again, uh, Representative Brown? Sure. Prohibits voting equipment that tabulates or aggregates votes used in official election results from connecting to any network, internet, or any device external to the voting system. And we've also added that any attempt to do so will be a Class D felony. We're requiring the county clerks to provide precinct level election results for voting. And this will include election day as well as in-person absentee voting. We've heard from a lot of folks that want that, want that data and require secure online connection for the transmittal of unofficial election results. And the bill also cleans up language that if a vacancy occurs after the June filing, de filing deadline uh, for um, unexpired terms, political party candidates are able to file certificates of nomination and not be limited to being a write-in candidate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, those are the highlights of the bill. I believe uh, Representative Decker also has a few words to say, if that's okay with you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, for having us today, and thank you to all the members. I wanted to comment just a little bit about the purpose of the bill, the same purpose we had in last year in House Bill 574. We intend to have elections that have integrity in Kentucky. We know of no reason for any voter in this state to feel that their elections are not secure. We want voter integrity and we want high voter turnout. And that's what every measure that we put forward is aimed at. We appreciate all of the election officials. Every election official in Kentucky has been involved in these bills. We appreciate the work of the county clerks. We hear from them individually and through their association, from the State Board of Elections, from the Secretary of State, all have been involved. These are people who have dedicated their professional lives to voter integrity and voter turnout. There's no one in that group who is interested in anything other than having free and fair elections. Not only that, we have 120 counties with 120 county clerks who are responsible and are elected by their constituents to ensure that the elections are, are fair and have integrity. These county clerks are from are bipartisan. They are from various parties. Not only that, they have boards of elections in each county that are bipartisan with four members, including the sheriff who is elected. And you heard various things today about the integrity of the count and the machines. They have seals, they have keys, they have certifications. Um, and all of this is done out of a civic duty by all of these people. There is no one in Kentucky. And what a broad, diverse set of voter officials there are in this state. If other states have problems, those are the problems in the other states. Our state has a system that is that has integrity and all of our efforts are in to, to ensure that because if if there is doubt in the integrity of your voting system people simply will not vote and so I just want the committee to be assured 
that all of these efforts are aimed at those goals. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to invite Representative Roberts to speak as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We've all seen headlines about harassment and threats lobbied at, uh, or lobbed rather, at poll workers in recent elections. KRS 119-255 levies a penalty, a Class D felony, for threat of violence or intimidation against election officials. In the committee sub, we update the definition to clarify the inclusion of precinct officers and poll workers. If we are to truly protect the integrity of our elections, we should start by protecting the people who operate our polling places on Election Day. Thank you. Thank you. We have the committee sub uh, that was moved and seconded. Now we need a voice vote on that committee sub. All in favor, vote aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, the committee sub is now fully in front of us for House Bill 564. We have uh, anybody else going to speak at the table? Uh, yes, Anderson County Clerk Jason Denny. Thank you, sir. I want to thank all the bill sponsors and all those parties involved in uh, drafting this uh, piece of legislation. Um, as with any bill, uh, we realized that 574, uh, once it was implemented, uh, there needed to be a few things added, and we took care of that gap for those voters to be sure that everybody had the ability to come in and vote. Uh, and any concerns with the County Clerk's Association were taken care of in, in this cleanup legislation. But thank you all for letting us be a part of this. We totally support this bill. Thank you. Uh, we do have questions. Representative Blanton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a question, and depending on the answer, a potential follow-up. Okay. Um, first of all, let me thank you all for bringing this. Um, having secure elections are, are very important to, to all of us, uh, not only to those who are putting themselves out there by being on the ballot, but also to our voters. Uh, oftentimes I've heard people say that well, there's no need of me going to vote and my vote don't count. Well, we want to make sure every vote counts because they do. It's our democratic process. But my question is, is this. Um, if this piece of legislation moves to the General Assembly, uh, there is an emergency clause. Uh, is there uh, expectations by the it having an emergency clause that it will be implemented and used in the upcoming May primary. That would be our expectation. Follow up. Sure. That being the case, my next question is going to be probably for the clerks. Um, you know, taking worst case scenario of timelines, this passes on the 14th day of April, the last day. There's 10 day veto period, uh, and it doesn't go into law, let's say, until or signed or not signed until the 24th of April, um, thereabouts, are the clerks gonna have enough time to prepare and implement the changes made in this piece? Because this is probably our biggest election we have in Kentucky when we have our local election years. Will you all be prepared to implement these changes by the May primary? Would me I would be admiss to say that timing is not of the it is of the essence. Uh, we have to have absentee ballots printed by the twenty eighth day of March. Um, machines will be uh, ready. Um, there is definitely a timing issue that we we are. It's pertinent that we get this bill this legislation uh, put through as quickly as possible. Um, the, the gap procedure uh, definitely needs to be taken care of that or that six days uh, that was missed in 574 um, that is very important to get taken care of so there could be some there are some timing issues uh, I think with the most part we can get it done uh, but the ballots have to be in our office by the 28th day of September okay thank you mr. Chairman. excuse me March March yes sir <laughs> representative Scott. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, usually I would ask for an explanation of the difference mm -hmm. between the committee sub and the original, but because it's 58 pages, I will refrain from that today. So instead, my question is in section one, it says uh, in addition of citizen of the United States, can you all explain to me the need for adding that particular phrase? Uh, yes, we, 
so that's already in section 145 of the constitution uh, which is i guess it might be line eight that that you see that's already in there uh but we decided to add that because we're talking about if you look at line line uh well it'd be line four here every person sits in the united states we talk about state and resident so we're break it breaks down um on the state level and then the uh the resident of the precinct so we thought let's put united states in there too to make sure we're covering all those bases thank you thank you chairman representative cantrell uh, thank you mr chair um my question is about some of the language um some of the language on page 50 and some of just the process that's outlined on page 41 it's about the online connections for voting machines so last year we passed a bill here that prohibit i think it passed all the way through was vetoed by the governor because there were some problems that were found later i think y'all know what i'm talking about that prohibited any machines from being able to go online well then i think we found out later that all machines uh, all voting machines that are made now are capable of being put online and um and that i guess that bill never actually became law after it was vetoed and then so I guess my question is, if, if we're making it a felony to connect a voting machine to a voting system, I guess it, it's the difference between a public network and a secured network. Is that is that right? Can you talk a little bit more about the process? Because I think it becomes an issue of when you allow someone to put those voting machines on the network and how you allow them to put mm -hmm. those voting machines on the network. And I think it becomes important for the public because when those how long it takes for those connections to take place and those results to be tabulated um means how long it's going to take for the public to know the outcome of an election so can you talk about that process and the timing and and how that actually practically is going to work yes i will try to answer that the best that i can the so last year from what we understand with that bill um there there would have been uh no election equipment that we would have been able to use uh would not have passed that what was in that language correct and we all did that in good faith thinking right. that we just didn't want uh you know people messing around with our networks right and and furthermore from from what i understand as well and state board of elections could probably confirm this as well kentucky voting equipment is doesn't even have a modem in it like it's not capable of being connected to a network what we wanted to put in this language was that if you, so there probably is, I believe there is some aftermarket um, upgrades to equipment that you can do that would allow it to be connected to a network. And some states, uh, from what we hear, actually do allow that. In Kentucky, we didn't want that to, to be the case. And so that's why we put the language in there. And, and that's okay. I'm just wondering how it's going to affect election results being reported on election night because i think in 2018 we had some problems with election results being reported in jefferson county they were a little bit Sorry. slow and i think it was when the i think it was because when the clerk decided to put those machines online and tabulate the results yes go ahead uh, it will not slow down the process at all Th that, that's great to know mr chairman yes when when Representative Branscombe says our machines don't have modems. There's a process for voting machines to be um, certified in a state. Mm -hmm. First of all, they have to go through a certification at the national level where there are Republicans and, and Democrats who look at every machine proposed. At that, le at that level, they could have modems if a state wanted that, and some do for the the speed of the election results that you're talking about. Kentucky does not. Once they clear the certification and they're tested to make sure they're safe and, and they go through a rigorous and, and they are allowed to come to the state, then we have our own state um, committee that authorizes the machines and they ensure that they do not have modems. So they do not have this capability to be connected. Um, Mr. Chairman, you, you had Representative Branscombe repeat a section 12 on page 34, line 25, about the voting equipment that tabulates and, or aggregates votes used in official results from connecting to the Internet. 
I understand there now is a question uh, about that because the allegation is we don't use voting machines to tabulate official results. But if you read that sentence, it says prohibits voting equipment that tabulates or aggregates vote used in official results. So all of those machines, while they're, they're unofficial until they are aggregated, checked for veracity, then they are used in the official results. So that, ex that covers every machine that it, that it can not have external um, devices. And that is a red hearing. Yeah, and, and the language, that language um, was a work group with the State Board of Elections to come up, to come up with that uh, language. It took them probably two or three hours to work through, um, I think, some of the language that you were talking about. And what, what they didn't want to do is put out, um, put out language that would keep us from really purchasing any type of election equipment. So we want to make sure that we were covering all the bases there. It's a very delicate balance, and I it really is. appreciate you answering my questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Nemus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question, um, something that's been asked to me of an official with the League of Women Voters, and I just wanted to make sure that my understanding is correct. Jason. So let me clarify how results are processed on election night. So each memory device is removed from each individual machine and brought back in a sealed envelope by a Democrat and Republican member of that precinct or vote center. It also is accompanied by a tape off of that machine signed by all election officers. So that tape is brought along with that. That memory device is inserted into a computer in a room without internet capability, first of all, and nor does the computer have internet capability. That we would run if, we, say for instance, we have 14 precincts, we had 14 cards to read, we would read all 14 cards, we would read the absentee card, knowing we had 15 precincts per se, we would know we had all our cards read, it would add all those totals by each race, each constitutional amendment, exit question, et cetera. And then we would get a, a report at the end that would be broken down by precinct. Now, of course, then we would take a USB, any USB, and download that information off of that machine that is not connected to the internet, that computer. Now we have to take that unofficial result and took it into a computer that will upload the unofficial result to the state for everybody to view like everybody wants to know the results now. Okay, you can view it that night. It's still unofficial. Then once we certify the vote, the County Board of Election in each county sends in a paper, handwritten, filled out, signed off on, official result. That's when that result becomes official. So we are never hooking a machine up to transmit votes that, are, first of all, are unofficial. The official result goes through the paper, we fax and we mail the official result to the Secretary of State's office for certification. The SB4, yeah, 49. 49. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Oh, uh, Nemus. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to let him answer that question for. So I have, uh, I'm submitting this question to you from a friend in the League of Women Voters just to make sure my interpretation is correct. Um, this lady's going to be out of Kentucky for two weeks, right before the election. And so, um, and she wants to make sure that she can vote absentee. It's her understanding that you can only vote absentee in those 14 days. That's not my understanding to make sure this is right. So you start voting absentee. You can start voting and start requesting about 45 days before the election, up to 14 days, and we're fixing that here. But for her question, she's going to be out of town for two weeks. Is she able to vote? before she leaves Kentucky? Currently, no, under 574. 
Well, she, if she knew she was going to be gone on the on the 13th day, yes, she could request an absentee ballot online, have it mailed to her house ahead of time to vote. She could start requesting 45 days before the election, and then when she gets that, which may take 10 days or whatever, she can vote at any time between then and the election, provided that it's received. Yes, if she's going to be gone during that okay. time frame. And that's the laws exist today, whether this bill passes yes. or not. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we have uh, House Bill 564 as amended by the committee substitute before us. Uh, discussions are complete. Uh, I need a motion. I got a motion by Derek Lewis, Representative, and Representative Heverin is the second. Madam Secretary, call the roll. Representative Blanton? Aye. Representative Cantrell? Yes. Representative Fisher? Representative Gooch? Yes. Representative Heverin? Yes. Representative Imes? Yes. Representative Cook? Yes. Representative Derek Lewis? Yes. Representative Scott Lewis? Yes. Representative Miller? Yes, and uh, Mr. Chairman, can I report a yes vote on HB 330? Yes. Okay. Representative Moser? Yes. Representative Namus? Yes. Representative Scott? Pass. Representative Weber? Yes. Representative Wheatley? Yes, and briefly explain. Yes. Thank you for bringing it again this year that the uh, – that hole that we had, to, the gap we had to correct is really important. Um, there are a few concerns here and there, but overall, and I really appreciate the county clerks being involved uh, in correcting their issues. Uh, as far as Representative Roberts' work on it, uh, I'm sure it, it really made everything much, much better, so that we're, we're all proud of that. No, I didn't. Um, that's a yes, and, and we may have missed a, a vote Yes, here. we just found that out. Thank Sorry. You. Representative Heron? Yes, I'd like to explain my vote. I'm going to yes. pass on this today. Um, obviously, I'm still new and haven't had a chance to look through the bill, um, but I do look forward to uh, connecting with you all if I have any questions or concerns. Thank you. Representative Bratcher? Yes. And uh, House Bill 564, as amended by the committee substitute, passes with favorable expressions. Represent Branscombe, Decker, Roberts, and Tipton. Thank you guys. You did a great job, I believe. So let's see let's see this thing through. Thank you guys. Thank you all. Okay, last bill is House Bill 470. 742. Yeah, that's it. 740. Simplify. <laughs> John, you were in the military too, right? I'm still in, actually. Yeah. Army? Army? National Guard? We got it. So we got Army covered. and the Marines, Army, Marines. up there. We <laughs> just the Navy, need uh, Navy, Navy, yeah. you know, such a mess. <laughs> hey, the floor is yours. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Cook. Chairman. I'm Representative Matt Cook from the 72nd District. I'm John Steffen, the executive. John? I'm John Steffen, Executive Director of the Registry of Election Finance. So here today to talk about everybody's favorite topic, campaign finance. Uh, Bill does three things. Uh, first, first thing we do on uh, moving for electronic versions, the hard copy. In the past, I think we all remember when you filed, you had to you know, hard copy back and forth. Now, the place where you file is in charge of sending that over to the uh, KREF and take care of that part where your point, you're still pointing your treasure, you're still doing all that. We're just moving that to electronic. Uh, for 3,000 and under filers that have always had to exemption, now we're saying that they still have to file for their exemption. So they got to do four things. They have to file for their exemption before the primary. They go to the primary. After the primary, 30 days after, they're going to have to file a financial report. If they won the primary, they will have to file a new exemption going into the general. After the general election, they'll have to file their post-general report. Um, and if any point in that process, if they're going to go over the $3,000, they need to notify KREF immediately. They're doing that. And then the final part of it, um, we had a problem with interpretation, um, and we want to move our annual filing report. If you're in a non-election year, 
to back to December 1st, which is the way it had been for many years until the interpretation on that. And I believe KREP wants to speak on it as well. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity today to speak on this. And, and um, kind of taking two approaches here. I, I saw this bill being drafted and, and helped with some of it and was all for it. Thinks it's, I think it's a great bill up until this language that was put in yesterday before. Regarding that, um, what I see is a reduction in the filing requirements. Um, I like that it, it adds back, it kind of is adding back in a 30-day post-election uh, requirement for those less smaller candidates that in the past had been there but kind of got dropped out when we dropped that $1,000 and under threshold that some of you may remember, the really small campaigns. But what this does, what, what, there is a, and part of this bill, what this bill does is clean up that kind of oddly written paragraph that resulted in the change in interpretation that, that you all have noticed. Um, right now, we have candidates who have completed their election, uh, may still have their campaign account open for whatever reason. Those candidates are on an annual filing requirement, so they file that report December 1st every year. Candidates who have already expressed their intent to run in a future year election, we have, based on my interpretation of the statute, our current interpretation of the statute, file quarterly reports uh, up until the year of the election, and that's what is being changed here. Um, there was a time that the agency interpreted the statute, relevant statute, to allow for incumbents to only file annuals while their challengers were having to file quarterlies, which, was, which made no sense to me. We reviewed the statute, realized that was probably a misinterpretation of the statute, and that's why we went to the quarterly filing for future year elections for all candidates, not just incumbents. And we still have the annual filing requirement for past elections. And that's what I, I really think that is the best approach. Um, it makes sure candidates are reporting as they go what they're raising, what they're spending. If they're making mistakes, if they're taking money, maybe they shouldn't be. That allows us to catch that on a quarterly basis rather than waiting till a whole year has passed before we point out their, their errors. Um, it's better for transparency um, to be on a quarterly filing requirement for future year elections. Public can see what's going on. Um, it, and I, I, I mean no disrespect, it's a, it's a good bill otherwise, but I think we're taking a step backwards by taking away that quarterly filing, filing requirement for future year elections. Uh, I just hate to see us take a step backwards and reduce transparency in elections when this bill is actually increasing transparency on the other hand. So I love the bill except for that that last part that was put in and what I'm talking about is on page um, 17, 18, the change there. Um, if there's some way to get rid of that, then I'd be behind this bill 100%. But with that in here, I really cannot support the bill. Uh, as that's, that's your opinion, right? My opinion, as the agency's opinion, I guess. Are you saying it's my opinion? Is it interpretation a, you're or? saying it's an official uh, opinion from the agency? Yes. I'm not speaking. You guys voted. You, you guys voted on it in the board. No, the board has not voted on it, but I've been authorized to speak on behalf of the board on legislative matters. But and, there's, and there there's is, nothing. Uh, this interpretation has been going on for the, the quarterly requirement has been going on for. To at least two years now since we since since we switched over to electronic filing, so it's not a new it's not a new concept I came up with this year. It's been how we've been applying the law since the electronic filing um, requirements came into effect. I just and I'd like to and respectfully disagree on the transparency part. You're can you're not losing. Can you move the mic closer? Yep. Sorry, both of you. <laughs> so I'm oh, sorry. I, I don't feel like you're losing anything on the transparency. This is we're talking about non-election years, and let's just use all of us here in the state house. Okay. Last year, 2021, would have been a non-election year for us. We're just saying file one report in December because you're not out there. We all This is not a full-time position for us, right? I'm a farmer. I'm out there. I'm farming. We're not doing this full-time. We're asking you to do. You're making all your reports. You're getting them in there before December 1st, so everything's available 30 days before the session start. It's all out there. It's all open. We're not reducing any of that. 
We're just saying in a non-election year, when you're not actively holding your fundraisers, when you're not out there asking for money and working it as hard as you can, let's reduce it to one time for everybody. This isn't just for us. This is for everybody that's in office in a non-election year. So we're just trying to make it a little easier. Not losing any transparency, in my opinion. Uh, Representative Heverin. Thank you. I'd just like to comment on the bill. Um, first off, thank you, Representative Cook, for bringing this. I, I greatly appreciate it. I think it's got some great stuff, especially uh, in regards to uh, candidates who opt to raise less than $3,000. Um, I'm going to say I agree with you on um, only filing once a year. I think that's very important. I don't think it's losing transparency. And I think there's still a lot of issues with KREF currently uh, with actually with the electronic filing. And so until we're able to get that fixed and have um, – complete confident that that's going to be done correctly I, I agree with representative cook about only having to file annually uh, during non-election years because generally most of us aren't fundraising um and that's just that's a, a lot of extra to put on and i love the december one date um especially because that that shows the transparency right before session goes in and there's no question about that so i fully support this bill i look forward to voting yes on it in just a few minutes thank you <clears throat> thank you um John, why is it important if if I'm in the odd year and and uh, a candidate in the odd, odd year receives uh, a donation in April and he reports it or she reports it in no uh, decent uh, end of November? Why is it so important to see it before that November if the election is the next year? Well, and that's what I was. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't answer that. Um, that's what I was trying to say. I, I think the sooner it's out there, the better for the public. Um, and, and keep in mind, we have a lot of candidates who are not experienced. Um, they're doing this for the first time. If they're if they're taking in money, we don't see it either. We won't see it until that annual. We the, the staff won't see it until the annual reports filed either. So they may have spent a whole year bringing in money from sources they shouldn't have been doing. I just think really that quarterly where you, we can see it, the public can see it, and, and it's not in an effort to try to catch things. It's not an effort to make things harder for people. It's just a, it's just that spot check along the way versus a whole year having passed of campaign fundraising and spending. Um, we don't want to see people get in a bad situation. We want to be able to help them along the way, and the quarterly reporting helps us do that. And I realize the system still has trouble. Um, valid point. Representative Heffern, um, it's making it's getting better and better every day. Um, I think the quarterly filing requirement would get easier and easier as we go forward. I think most of the problems you all have seen, uh, some of the problems some of you all saw this time may have been because we were not expecting fundraising. Um, there was fundraising occurring that should have been going on a on quarterly reports that you all were expecting to go on annuals because that's what you were used to. So that the system wasn't set up to allow you, I know, I know we talked about that yesterday by email, that to allow you to, to add those in um, on that first quarterly report you filed because you weren't used to filing quarterly yet. Um, so I just think it's a better approach. It's a, it's a cleaner approach. Um, it's not to make things harder on you all. I, I guess I could say the opposite. You have to report it one way or the other. You can be entering it as you go, hitting the submit button four times a year versus entering it at the end of the year and hitting it once. Um, the system was meant to make it something that you can use as you go through the year and not wait to the last minute to put your information in. So if you're doing that, I don't think the, the, the burden is that much more for you to hit submit four times a year versus one time a year. Uh, and, we're not, and, and I'm talking to you as representatives. We're talking about all the candidates across the state. Um, I just think it's a better approach to, to do it quarterly. Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative Cook, thanks for the bringing the bill. Um, I do support cor uh, the annual filing in off years. I mean, it's still December 1 is still five weeks before filing deadline. If there's a problem that's that bad, maybe it'll convince them to get out of the race. As long as it applies to everybody equally, I, I think it's – fine with me. My question to you, Mr. Stephan, is in uh, on page 17 of the bill, the last, well, on page 27 of page 17, a sentence starts, 
candidates, slate of candidates, candidate authorized committee shall make all reports required by this section during the year in which the election takes place. I just want to make sure there's not a loophole we're creating to let, you know, somebody only file in December of an election year and not all the other required. Okay. I mean, certainly not right. I, yes, that's I mean, been a I'm, that's I'm, been a. Uh, if course. you look at the top of age, page eighteen, it required by this section during the year in which the election takes takes place. Okay. I mean, it, it says right. it. And we w had to ask a question. Here we worked with the bill drafter to make sure. I mean, even though I was against it, I, I wanted to make sure it worked. Sure. And, and did what was intended to do. Because, no, I, I agree. And and I not, appreciate your work, John. You've thank been you. great. I'm not running again. Thank God. But uh, <laughs> uh, I had a great volunteer treasurer and. Uh, but I think as confidence in the electronic system grows, as you say, people will just enter information periodically and hit enter and be done with it. So thank you. I lack I lack some confidence in the system myself, so I don't. So I understand, and I and I do. What one thing I do appreciate. Can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a daily task for me. But one thing I do appreciate about this language is that it applies equally to all candidates. That's that was my big concern with how we were applying it before was why should an incumbent get away with filing it once a year versus new new candidates had to file quarterly that didn't make any sense to me and, and seemed unfair and therefore the wrong way to interpret the language that was in there so i do appreciate this across the board everybody's going to be treated the same way and that that's certainly the way to do it if you want to go with with the annual filing requirement chairwoman moser thank you mr chair and thank you very much for bringing this bill. I think it does simplify the reporting uh, process. We, uh, I, I know that my treasurer is on a first name basis with Christy King at KREF. So um, there have been a lot of challenges with moving from paper to the electronic reporting. I, I think it's a great idea. It's just been, there have been a lot of growing pains. Uh, but I have a question about the rationale for the, the, the I guess the desire to uh, stick with quarterly reporting is it to know when the contribution was received, and if so, can't we just add a date? Yeah, well, the date the date will be in there regardless. Of well, then annual why do we need to report quarterly then? I mean, I kind of equate it. That's kind of like asking why should we why do we report more in the election year than we do. In an off election year it's just i'm equating more reporting to better um for example we added we being you all uh the legislature added a 60-day pre-election uh pre-general election filing requirement a couple of years ago that hadn't been there so it was just that's additional additional reporting additional um review of, of what's being taken in well, I guess I go with the more is better. And, and I can add during, during an election year, absolutely. You know, I agree with it. I'm, I'm thrilled that we have that in there. But in an off year for everyone, it's it's an undue burden. Just quick follow-up. Sure. I, I, I would agree, um, Representative Cook, that, you know, I mean, during an off year, we, we don't have these contributions coming in. We, you know, we it's not the same uh, number of contributions, certainly. No. I think if somebody wants to know when a contribution came in, um, you know, probably for clarification purposes for KREF to make sure that it's within the uh, period of time that we're allowed to fundraise, um, but that really doesn't affect us in an off year. So um, I, I mean, I think this really simplifies if we have a date on the contribution, um, I, I don't see that it's any less transparent. Thank you. Representative Nemeth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to say I agree that more is better. The problem we have, and we have the executive director of the agency saying he lacks confidence in the system. I, I want the citizens to know this system is not good. The, the, the last year, I, I, I don't think it can be uh, overemphasized how difficult this system is for the in, at the input level. Your staff is incredibly helpful. They're incredibly responsive, and you guys are being commended for that. What I'd like to see is I'd like to see the system be perfected, and I would like immediate reporting, 30 days after every contribution. I don't care what time of the year, but the system has to improve. It is very bad. Um, and so I also want to highlight, it's been said a couple times, but I want to say it as clearly as I possibly can for people walk, watching on KET, the election years, there are multiple reportings. That's not touched here. 
What's what the only thing that's changed in this bill with respect to the, the reporting timelines is during a non-election year, we report on December the 1st. And, and that's important because we have session on January the 1st and also filing deadlines for the next year for the for the for the election. And so our citizens can hold us accountable if they don't like who's contributing to us, if we're raising too much, too little from whatever. Um, so all that accountability is still in place. But what I would like to ask you, Mr. Stefan, to, to do is let's get this system really good. And then I'll support an immediate reporting because I don't see any reason why, if it's going to be simple, you can't just go in after a fundraiser and punch all the, the numbers in. Actually makes it much simpler. But at the, as it exists today, this system is terribly bad. Um, and so I don't know if you have any comment on that, but I wanted to just clarify that for the for the record. Um, yeah, let me – I do want to say one thing. When I say I don't have any confidence in the system, certainly not in the – I want to make it clear I'm not criticizing the accuracy of what the system puts out. Right. It's, yes. it's, it's not that. It's just can I sit here and say, Representative Nevis, you will have no trouble with that system, you know, with, with putting your information in. I can't, I can't say that. I can't, I can't tell you you won't have trouble because – we keep having bugs turn up that makes it difficult for an individual. Sometimes, sometimes it's fine. It's, that's, it's that kind of confidence. Like, is it going to be every user going to have 100% ease of use with this system? I cannot tell you that yet. But I know what it's putting out, what goes in, what goes out is accurate. I just And it's a big improvement from paper filing. Um, it is. We're, head, we're heading in the right direction. I, it's yeah. just been a struggle. I'm frustrated with the system. I have you don't y'all aren't dealing with it every day like I am so yeah I'm I'm very frustrated with the development of the system and how slow it's gone and how poorly it's been done to be honest with you but um, I do think we we are making progress with it and when I do the, think it's a lot better than it was two years ago just once I'm going to highlight this in one sentence mm -hmm. when the citizen goes to the ballot box they'll have the same information that they'll that if this bill passes as they had before to hold their elected officials accountable yes they will thank you I agree we have a motion by. Representative Blanton and a second by Scott Lewis, representative. Uh, representative Heron. Yes, thank you. Um, I just have a, a little, I just want a little bit more clarity on the reporting piece. Obviously, I just got finished doing um, uh, the special election, and I think the finance reporting was probably like my biggest headache, and, and so I'm glad that I had a, a great uh, treasurer. So currently, the way it 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 works now um is current elected officials they do still they do report quarterly is that what we're saying and this would make it to where they only report once a year let me let me try to clarify that um now now that your election is passed for, for you i'll use you as an example the special election you have a 30-day post-election report required because that's part of your election year for you and then if you keep your account open, you'll have to file a 60-day post. And if you stay, if it stays open past there, then you'll, you'll have to report annually on that old election. So if you already know you're going to run for re-election, well, it'll be in November. Well, we're in the election year now. But if, if somebody, say we, we have candidates that have already expressed their intent to run for governor next year, they're on a quarterly filing requirement schedule right now. This bill would, would reduce that. So they'd want to, they would have to file one in December and then start filing all the normal reports next year. So it's just on those future year elections, the information will still be captured, as, as, as everybody has said. It will be captured on the annual report versus broken down over four reports. So there is no, there's not less information being provided. It's just being provided with this bill being provided less times than it would have been under the current application of the law. Okay. Does that help? It does help. I think that it just kind of um, it just makes me concerned. I know that we've talked about the transparency piece of just like where is money coming from, who's folks getting money from. Um, just as a new person that is elected, I think that I would like to see it stay quarterly instead of that at the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, discussion, questions? You know, uh, Mr. Stefan, just like uh, – Representative Nemus said uh, every one of your uh, group over there has always been excellent to work with, very helpful. You have been helpful to work with. But I really don't know why you're here bringing objections to this. It's, it's, 
your 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 comments are interesting, but they certainly don't persuade. That's for sure. And I just think that there would be better things you could be doing. But you know, you you are in charge of a strong agency, and uh, and you have the right to your opinion. But I don't think that there's anything less than this. Matter of fact, for years and years. I did an annual report, and I think most that have been around here for a while have done annual reports, and nobody's complained. Has anybody complained outside of your agency? Well, I don't know if they would know to complain, um, because we went from annuals for incumbents to quarterly, so they wouldn't have complained about more reports, I don't think, other than those having to file the reports. And Are I'm here because I, I feel like, I mean, it's just, I feel like it's my job to do this. Sure. Okay. Did you have something, Matt? No, I mean, it's. I think it's pretty simple. We all understand. We all do finance reports. It's okay. pretty easy to find out where you lie. Okay, we have a motion on uh, House Bill 740. Uh, Secretary, call the roll. Representative Blanton? Aye. Representative Cantrell? Yes. What was that? No. Representative Fisher? Representative Gooch? Yes. Representative Heverin? Yes, and quickly explain my vote. Sure. Uh, I am voting yes today, and I do want to uh, echo the comments of my colleagues. You have a great staff at you have a great staff at KREF, and we greatly appreciate all your help. I know uh, whether it's us calling or our treasurers calling, you all are always quick to find an answer, and I, I do appreciate that. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Representative Heron, can I explain my vote? Yes. I'm going to vote no on this today, and hopefully get some. Uh, a deeper understanding and clarification about the concerns I talked about previously. Thank you. Representative Imes? Yes. Representative Cook? Yes. Representative Derek Lewis? Yes. Representative Scott Lewis? Yes. Representative Miller? Yes. Representative Moser? Yes. Representative Namath? Yes. Representative Scott? Chairman, I'd like to explain my vote. Yes. Thank you so much. I just want to say that I lack confidence in every system um, and, and actually I appreciate your staff and you and you actually did persuade me so I'm voting no. That was a yes. It's a no. So, okay. Representative Weber? Yes. Representative Wheatley? And briefly explain. Yes. I, I am going to vote no um, and this kind of reminds me of other things that we have done as a General Assembly to reduce the transparency level. So anytime that we change a rule, change the law, and it drops the level of transparency we have for the public, then I don't see that as, as a good thing. I, I see that as something we shouldn't be doing. Um, and for that reason, I am voting no. I, I also want to, I'm sorry, real quickly, that we, we're, we're also looking at this from the viewpoint of House of Representatives every two-year okay. candidates, and there are four-year candidates and four-year um, uh, incumbents, and they will be reporting on a quarterly basis under the current interpretation, and that's best, and that's best for all of us. We, we need to know who are making those contributions all year round um, and every year, and that goes for statewide offices and county offices in the four-year terms, so that's my vote. Representative Bratcher. Yes. House Bill 740 passes with favorable expression. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Thanks. It's over. We adjourn. <laughs>